You're listening to a message preached from the pulpit of the Bible Baptist Church, St. Thomas, Ontario. There was a, a growing cynicism of, of uh, development of, uh, of Gnosticism, and I'll, and I'll show you the agnostic in a little bit. It, it's very prevalent today in many parts of the world, and it's becoming very, very prevalent in our own country. And so Paul writes to address that and to help the church and say, listen, here's, here's what's going on around you. Be careful of that. Watch for those things. Because here's what I want. I want you to stand strong. I want you to be in the will of God. I want you to be doing all those things that you ought to be doing for the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossae was the city uh, that, that was decimated by an earthquake in 60 AD. No longer there. We begin by looking at this church and we look at what all churches are. We look at the people, number one tonight. Paul penned to the saints, the saints of Colossae. He's writing to the church. He's not writing to the community. He's not writing to the lost. He's writing to the saints. And he's writing to the faithful brethren, the faithful brethren. Grace and peace are sought upon them from the heavenly Father. Tonight, it ought to be our prayer, it ought to be our desire that grace and peace be upon the people of our church as well. There's not a one of us tonight that doesn't need the grace of God upon our lives. Grace is that unmerited favor. We sing amazing grace. Unmerited, unearned, really undeserving favor of God. We are sinners. We mess up. We, we struggle. And yet God continues to love us. That's his grace. That's his mercy. Have you ever thought if you were God, how many people you'd like to wipe out just because they drive you crazy? <laughs> I've thought that thought. I've thought if I was God, you would not be alive right now. But I have to think this, if I was, if I really was honest and looked at my life from God's eyes, I shouldn't be alive right now. Well, I've messed up. I've, I've failed God so many times. I, I've been so human sometimes. But God is gracious and merciful. And he says, not only do I want the grace of God, I want the peace of God on your life. I wrote some today who had written to Bearing Precious Sea because we put a John of Romans in their mailbox. And um, one man wrote, and he was very hostile. He was very upset and very, very harsh with his words. And I said, sir, I said, I'm so sorry. I said, you, you seem to be a person who's got some real hardship and, and difficulty in your life. I said, I'm going to pray the peace of God comes into your life. I said, we have sent that John and Romans trying to find people who are simply looking for some peace and contentment in their lives. And sir, I'm sorry if you're a person who already feels they have that in your life, but there are a lot of people in our country who don't. Would you do me a favor? Would you simply pass it on to somebody who could maybe use the peace of God in their life? I, I write that with kind of a, almost a backhandedness to, to say, sir, I, in my heart, I know you're speaking like this because you don't have a peace. You don't have a contentment. You, you, obviously, there's some things that are causing you some great grief in this life. I want the peace of God in my life. I, that's why we're here tonight, isn't it? Because we're looking for, we have, we want to maintain, we, we want to distribute the peace of God. There are a lot of people in this world today that don't have peace. They don't have contentment. You and I know it. We see it. And it baffles me that they won't receive it when we try to give it to them. I, I really don't. I, I, again, I know it's the devil. I know it's part of the heart of mankind. But I don't understand when somebody receives the scriptures in their mailbox, why they get so upset. Why do they get so mad at that? To me, and, and maybe because I live in the Stone Age and because I live, you know, in a different era in my mind, I just, I, I can't fathom that people would be that upset by simply having the scriptures. But then I look at this world and I, and I look at what they've been taught and I look at, at what they're receiving and, and I look at what they're looking forward to and I realize the reason they're angry is because they think that somebody's got something they don't have. I, they're angry because they think somebody's trying to push something on them. Somebody's trying to force something on them that they don't want. When in essence, we're not pushing or forcing at all. We're simply saying, here's something that we found that was a help to us. And we want you to have it. Maybe if they could see us, maybe if they, if they could hear our message, maybe we need to do some videos of people from our church and say, hey, as you come to this website and look for the information to contact us or, or, or seek us out, uh, we just want you to know we're just normal people that, that love our country. We, we want you to know Christ. Paul says to the church, I want you to know peace and I want you to know the grace of the Father. Kind words to what appears to be a very kind people. 
A key phrase is found in verse 4. He says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. Do you, have a, do you have a love for all the saints? Do you have a love for all the saints? Do you have a love for the people that are around you tonight? Do you have a love for people that maybe don't go to our church but know Jesus Christ as their Savior? You know, I, I don't agree with everybody in our town that calls themselves a Christian, but I, if they're saved... They're our brothers and sisters in Christ. They may not do things exactly the way we do, but they're our brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and, and in honesty, if they love Jesus Christ and they're trying to win other people to Jesus Christ, I have to praise the Lord for that. I just say that's great, that's awesome. And, and there are people that will win other people to Christ that I won't be able to because they're a little bit different. And, and, and I know we, we want the same doctrine, we want people to be the same that way. We, we, we have a, a set of things that we believe in and we want all people to believe that. But if we take away all else, if they're saved, if they know Christ, we ought to have a love for them. We ought to have an encouragement for them. We want to have the peace of God and the grace of God upon them. I like that. We heard of your faith in Christ and the love which they had to all saints. What qualities would you like for our church to be known for? What qualities would you like for our church to be known for? Let me ask you that question tonight. Answer me, would you? What qualities would you like our church to be known for in this community? Rick Holmes. Yeah, truth and, uh, sincerity. truth and sincerity. I like that. Truth and sincerity. Anybody else? What do you want? Randy. Doctrine and love. Kevin. Honesty and faithfulness. I like those. Allison. Charity and consistency. Giving to others, helping others, loving others, and consistency. I like that. Anything else? Miss Holmes. Kindness and forgiveness. Those are good. Let me ask you tonight. Do you think we possess those qualities now? I would like to say yes. Yes. I would like to say yes. I would like to think that that is our church. Is that how we're portrayed in our community? Well, again, I, I'd like to say yes. I, I, I can't tell you for sure. I would have to ask some others. I, I heard of a large church, and, and the pastor was a very successful businessman, got into the ministry, built a, a, a wonderful ministry for Christ, and he sat with um, his staff one day, and he kind of asked that question. What is our church known for? What do people think about us? And somebody said this, they know us for what we're not. They know us for what we're not. We're not drinkers. We're not smokers. We're not dancers. We're not gamblers. The things that we're not. And the pastor said, well, maybe they should know us for what we are, not, we're not what we're not. Now, we take a stand in some of those things, and, and we preach on some of those things. But really, I believe today, and, and I've said this before, that idea of winning some by fear and some by compassion is not just talking about an individual. I think that's talking about a generation as well. And there is no question that in this generation, the generation that is now about us, this generation is looking for people that are sincere, that are honest, that are upfront, but are also kind and considerate. I will tell you that I think in past that Independent fundamental Baptist preachers were known to be very hard. To be very hard. To stand in the pulpit, pound the pulpit, hellfire, damnation. And I'll tell you, I like some of that. I like that up front. I like that straightforward. I, I like men that will just tell you the way it is. But I've learned this, that in this day we have to temper that with love and compassion as well. I can tell you the truth as long as I tell you in a way that you can see that my heart is really trying to help you. If I just say the truth, Bruce Mifflin, your tie is crooked. So what? So what? But if I say, hey, Bruce, can I fix your tie? It's, it's crooked and it's just, man, it looked great. But it's, mm. it's not what you say. It's how you say it. You're going to die and go to hell and spend eternity in the flames of hell. That's the truth. But many are not going to receive that today, are they? But if we say to them,
Can I tell you what the Bible says? There's a place called heaven. And it's an awesome place. And there's another place, and it's called hell. And that's reserved for those who reject Jesus Christ. I want you to know that God loved you. And God wants you to be saved. I think we need to be stern. I think we need to be straightforward. I, I think we need to, to, to make it black and white. But I think today, as in all times, because Paul's saying, here, here's what made a difference in this church. You're kind people. You're loving people. To the saints, and we see also outside of the church later on, they, they had an impact in a community because they showed them something they don't normally see. My first response to people that write us and say, you don't put that in my mailbox. My first response is to lash out and say, you goofball, we're just trying to help you get off my back. I don't care what you... I... But then I start thinking about it and I think, well, that person's not saved. They don't know Christ. They, they don't know peace. They don't have the grace of God yet. They're lashing out because maybe they had a bad experience in a church. They're lashing out because maybe somebody did try to force a religion upon them, or maybe somebody in a religion tried to force themselves upon them. And maybe that's why they're so angered, because people don't see Bible Baptists. They see religion. They don't see a group of people in St. Thomas that love our country and want to give them the gospel. They see a religious organization. And so sometimes that anger and that hurt comes out. Those are great qualities that our church has and needs to continue to possess as well. Imagine the impact we'd make if we'd live out every day just those two things that Paul marked, or that, uh, that Paul marked when he said, you're kind and you're loving. Imagine if we'd just do that. Paul then speaks not to the people, but to the preacher. The pastor of the church of Colossae was Epaphras. Noted as a competent, conscientious, and careful expounder of the word in verses 5 and 6. Competent, conscientious, and careful expounder of the word. Boy, how we need that today. One of our guys commented today, said, we have, some, we have some great men in our church that help pastor this church. And we do. We're very fortunate. I know there are churches that don't have pastors. And I'm trying desperately to find them pastors and help them. We have men on our staff that, working through our Bearing Precious Seed ministry, are able to also work with our church and to help in that pastoral leadership. We have those who are given to the pastoral role. And man, that's awesome. This man was a competent, conscientious, and careful expounder of the word, a dear fellow servant in verse 7, a faithful minister, a servant of Christ, we are told in verse 7. Faithful minister. Boy, we need faithful ministers today. I am so tired of the news, and I know you are growing weary of account after account after account of people who have mistreated other people and made accusations that people had, had abused them in one form or another. And I'm tired of the number of times that we hear of pastors or a youth pastor or a deacon or a director or a Sunday school teacher who've taken advantage of others and not been faithful. How I pray that I might remain faithful. How I pray that every leader in our church would remain faithful. This pastor was one who bragged on his people in verse 8. He said, Paul, let me tell you about our church. Let me tell you, let me tell you a little bit about them. Man, they're loving people. They're kind people. They're really trying to help our community by giving them the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're bearing fruit of their salvation. We're seeing other people saved and other people grow in the things of Christ because they love the Lord. I loved your answers in our Connect class last week. Many alluded to or said that one of the things they need most from Bible Baptist Church is solid, clear, and uncompromising truth from God's word. We have that. And we need to continue in that. And we need to pray for that. And we need to stand for that. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15 says, Speaking the truth in love. And again, as a pastor, I want people to come to our church and hear in a clear tone that they are a sinner, they have a need of a Savior, but that Savior is provided through Jesus Christ, and all they have to do is receive Christ. Then I want them to hear this. You need to be baptized. 
You need to follow the Lord in that first step of, uh, of the believer and, and, and obedience to Christ. Be baptized. Then I want him to hear this. You need to live for Christ. You need to live right for Christ. You need to live in accordance to God's holy word. Not what you think, not what I think, not what anybody else thinks, but what God's word says. And in order to do that, church, you've got to know God's word. You've got to study God's word. You have to apply to God's word. And if I see that it's not right, then I have an obligation to come to you as a brother in Christ and, and as a pastor and say, listen, there are some things that are not right. Let me help you get that right. And to do that in such a way that people say, that man's trying to help me because he loves me. My doctor's a great doc guy. Dr. Doherty has been an awesome guy for our family. We don't go to the doctor very often. Praise the Lord, we've had very little serious sickness in our lives, but we've had to go to the doctor a few times. And Dr. Doherty is a great guy. He's not a Christian. Um, I've talked to him about the Lord. I've invited him to our church. I wish he'd come. He'd, he'd be a great Christian. Um, but Dr. Doherty is very kind and he's helped us. But I'll tell you this, I don't believe Dr. Doherty tries to help us because he loves us. He likes us. I'm his patient. He's a doctor. He's taken an oath. And I believe he really does want to try to help people, but I don't necessarily think he wants to help me because he loves me, because he really doesn't know me. What's different about Christianity is we're trying to help people become well too, but we're doing it because we do love them. And I'll tell you this, I've talked to some of our young people who work with people who are homosexuals or transgender. And they've taught me this, that if we're going to win people like that to Christ, and some of them are very difficult, but if we are ever going to have an impact in those kind of lives, we are going to do it by showing them that we absolutely love them. Hate their sin. Hate it. Don't like it. I don't like any sin. I don't like lying. I don't like gossip. I don't like backbiting. I, I don't like that. I don't like their sin. But we have to love them. And here's, here's what I've heard from some folks. Some of those people are absolutely amazed when somebody finds out that they're of that persuasion of sin and they don't ridicule them and they don't lash out at them and they don't condemn them. They say, hey, I'd like to introduce you to somebody who really loves you. His name is Jesus. And that makes a difference. Do we hate the sin? Yeah. Do I want to lash out sometimes? Yes. Do I want to say to him, what in the world are you doing? That's so unnatural. But I have to understand, they're not saved. They don't know Christ. They've never been taught. They don't know the difference. And so he talks to these people. And he talks of their love and kindness. And once the address and notation is made of the people and the preacher, Paul moves on to the purpose Asia Minor was home to a school of agnostics. Gnosticism teaches that human reason is incapable of providing sufficient rational grounds to justify either the belief that God exists or the belief that God does not exist. I'll read that for you again. Agnosticism teaches that human reason is incapable of providing sufficient rational grounds to justify either the belief that God exists or the belief that God does not exist. So in other words, we don't have enough intelligence, we don't have enough information to prove that God does or does not exist. An agnostic will not say there is no God, but an agnostic cannot say there is a God. They kind of live in that limbo in between. We've chosen, I mentioned this morning, a guy that wrote and said, you know, I, I don't, I'm not responding to your God that doesn't exist. I'm responding to you that does exist. And I wrote back and I said, how do you know I exist? You've never seen me. You've never heard my voice. You never looked into my eyes. How do you know I exist? Simply because I wrote you a letter on, on an on a email? He would say, I can't know that God exists. Well, I told him, I said, I believe God does exist. I believe through the creation of this world, through what I see, through the experience I've had, through what the Holy Spirit's done in my life, I believe there is a God. I, I believe I know that God. I believe I have a relationship with that God. I believe I can know that God better. Agnostics would say, no, you can't do that. Many agnostics would say, if God exists, he has created us and then left us to be. He might be out there, but he doesn't really want to be involved in our lives. That doesn't make sense to me. Why would God create something and say, I don't want anything to do with it? We announced this morning, and man, we, man I'm just so happy. My daughter's going to have a baby. There's, there's a creation there. 
She and Derek have, have had a wonderful marital relationship and, and now there's a baby coming into their lives. Do you think they're going to have that baby and then just sit in the crib and say, oh, that's great, awesome, see ya? No. They're going to pick up that baby and hold that baby and kiss that baby and bring that baby over to Big Poppy's house and Big Poppy's going to look after the baby until it's dirty and then Grandma's going to look after the baby. We're going to love that child, play with that child. Nate and Allison were talking about, they're going to be the, the, the uncle and aunt. They're all excited about that. They're going to do those fun things. We're not going to just see that little created being and say, well, that's, that's awesome. Hey, have a great life. Hope you make it. No. God created us and said, I love you. I want to spend time with you. I want to embrace you. I want to show you how much I love you. Either that teaching was near or had crept into the church somehow. And Paul's letter, in better part, challenges the school of thought. And we see that clearly in verses 9 and 11 in these key statements. Filled with the knowledge of his will in all. Wisdom and spiritual understanding. Then he says, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And finally, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power. He said there is a God and we need to know that God and we need to grow in our knowledge of that God. I'd have to say Canada, once a Christian nation, has become much more agnostic. Church, church tonight, be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that those things don't creep into your lives or creep into our church. There are too many churches today that have simply said, be a good person, do the best you can, and we hope that in the end, in the, in the way scales, that everything works out. And that's, that's the message that people are getting. We don't need that. The balances have been made and we've, been fall, we've fallen short by sin. And Jesus Christ comes into our lives and outweighs that sin by his love in our lives and his forgiveness and his salvation. And we are then found innocent. That's the message that people need to hear because people cannot be good enough to free themselves from the condemnation of sin. Paul concludes with the central theme of next week's message, and I'll just give you the touch of it so that we can look at it next week. Number four, the principal person. The principal person. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us me to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Paul said, church, I've heard that you're a good people. I know that you got a great pastor. I know that there's some things going on around you, and I want to protect you of that. But here's what I really want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about Jesus. I want to talk to you about knowing him. I want to talk to you about growing in him. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. The agnostics will tell you that God doesn't exist because you can't see him. I'm telling you, God is invisible. We worship him in spirit and in truth. Not only defending the existence of God, but showing that Christ is that God in the flesh. That heavenly father of which I speak, you have not seen, but there is one who's come that we can see, and his name is Jesus. God in the flesh. The book of Colossians is an awesome study, and we're going to go through it over the next four weeks taking each chapter and taking it apart and looking to see what God has. Tonight I conclude with this. Are you saved? Do you know Christ? And I believe that every person in this auditorium tonight would be able to say, unless they're a small child, I'm saved. So let me ask you this tonight. Do you love the saints? All saints? Do you tonight have a, a desire that others would know the peace and the grace of God in their lives? Are you tonight filled with the purpose of God? Do you know him? Do you know what he has for you? Do you know what direction he's taking you in? And then I would ask you tonight, do you know that principal person, Jesus Christ, in a very real way? Tonight, I want you to examine your life and I want you to ask these questions. Number one, am I that kind of Christian that I ought to be? Am I that loving, kind, understanding person? 
I've got to tell you, I'm not always that way. I'm not always that way. That's something I need to work on daily. I need to ask myself, am I a lover of the saints the way that God would have me to love the saints? Can I, can I encourage others in the things of Christ, even if they're not necessarily in our church? If they're winning people to Christ, if they're showing people Christ, can I say, hey, man, amen for that? Can I be that kind of Christian that says, hey, I see another brother. They might be in another church. They might be in another town. And I see that you have a need. Can I help you with that? Am I that kind of Christian that can go to the world and say, I want to show you the love of Christ. I want to overcome all barriers. I want to be different than, 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 than any stereotype you might know. And I simply want to love you to Christ. While at the same time maintaining a truth and a clarity and an honesty that we ought to have. Is that you? If it's not, then how about tonight we say, Lord, help me. Lord, make me that person. Fill me with those things. Let's be that Colossian church full of a people surrounded by agnostics, but still loving Christ the way they should. Let's pray. We trust you've enjoyed this message preached at the Bible Baptist Church of St. Thomas, Ontario, pastored by Dr. Al Stone. We invite you to be a part of our worship service this Sunday 